I thank you all for joining us on this occasion, which uh, is being held one day after what would have been his 92nd birthday. There are some in the audience who didn't know him, so Pauline Narsipur Yoganarsim Sharda Prasad was a journalist, editor, freedom fighter, writer, translator, bureaucrat, teacher, and cultural scholar, you can go on and on. He was news editor of the Indian Express Bombay at the age of 24, and the first Indian Neiman Fellow at Harvard in 55-56. Joined the government of India in 1957 uh, due to uh, certain Mr. Mohan Rao who said, if you could have worked for Goenka, why can't you work for Nehru? Uh, so he worked in the publications division and then succeeded Kushwan Singh as the editor of the Yojana magazine in the planning commission before being picked by Indira Gandhi to join her staff. And he was the information advisor to three prime ministers for over 20 years, starting from 1966. Received the Padma Bhushan in 2000 and the Indira Gandhi Award for National Integration. And he served as the Vice President of ICCR, the Chairman of NID, and various other things. Uh, Sharda Prasad wrote and edited several books. Uh, one is called The Book I Won't Be Writing, uh, and was an editor of the collected works of Jawaharlal Nehru. He also translated R.K. Narayan, Swami and Friends into Kannada, and several of K. Shivram Karan's books into English. Sharda Prasad wrote Shauri as a family and old friends called him had a wide range of interests and was involved with a large number of institutions. The concept behind the memorial lecture is to celebrate these diverse engagements that he had. The freedom movement, the Indian nation, media and journalism, language, literature, Canada, design, music, culture, nature, and many other things such as mangoes. And we would have been very happy to know that we ate our first mangoes today. Uh, the first lecture was delivered by Mukul Keshwan on India and Republican virtue. The second by Sanjay Baru on media, business and government. The third was delivered by Sugata Srinivasaraju on negotiating two worlds, bilingualism as a cultural idea. The fourth was by K. Ullas Karan on rediscovering nature in a crowded subcontinent. Today we have India's preeminent independent historian, writer and environment Dr. Ramchandra Goha, and he will speak about the art and craft of historical biography. A friend asked me some days ago, how do you manage to get speakers one would run to hear, even if there wasn't this special Shauri connection? And I think it's because of who Shauri was, and his ability to befriend a wide variety of people, including the finest minds and talents across generations and cultures. One such person is today's speaker. Uh, Ram Goha needs little introduction to most of you, so I'll spare you a long recitation of his biography. Look it up in Wikipedia, it's fairly accurate. <laughs> um, other than to note that he is the recipient of the Leopold Hibby Prize of the American Society for Environment, Environmental History for 2001, the R.K. Narayan Prize, the Padma Bhushan, uh, the Sahitya Academy Award for Indira after, uh, India after Gandhi. <laughs> and the Fukuoka Asian Cultural, uh, Culture Prize uh, last year. He's written many books of which I'll only list a few. Uh, this Fishered Land, an Ecological History of India, with Madhav Gargan. Savaging the Civilized, Very Elvin, His Tribals in India. A Corner of a Foreign Field, an Indian History of a British Sport. India After Gandhi, the History of the World's Largest Democracy. And Gandhi Before India. Instead of reading his long Wikipedia biography, I'll try to give an idea of my father's friendship with Ram. In an article several years ago, Ram wrote that he first met my father at G. Park Sati's house, an occasion when G. P. Mama was in full flow, probably about cricket. <laughs> in that article, Ram noted, when Shada Prasad writes, if you have any sense, you drop everything else and read him. If I were to guess why Ram became a good friend of my father, it's probably in these words that he wrote in another article. I'm quoting Ram. If I was to describe Sharda Prasad in one word, it would be civilized. He was the most civilized person I know, and that is embodied in his appreciation of the four great arts, music, painting and aesthetics, literature, and cricket. I first came in touch with him through the book on Karnataka that he and T.S. Satyan did in the late 1970s. It was a celebration of the state, and in it, 
Shanta Prasad wrote, the grace and elegance of Karnataka are expressed in the brush strokes of K.K. Ebbar and the square cuts of D.R. Vishwanath. In yet another article in the Hindu titled The Good Indian, Ram wrote, a friend of mine once described Sharda Prasad as a thinking man's Kushwan Singh. <laughs> the characterization was accurate as well as incomplete. Um, for the scholarship was subordinated to an integrity of character and a selfless commitment to the country that he shared with his readers. This quiet, learned, dignified, and always decent man was above all else an Indian. Uh, I recall my father telling me, it was probably after I read an article in the paper, probably cr cricket related, you know he's not a Bengali. And that's how we learned of an older family connection. Among my parents' circle of friends soon after they moved to Delhi in the late 50s were people like Sheila Dhar and Ram's aunt, cousin, uh, several connections, uh, Dharma Kumar. But I'm convinced that even more than that connection, it was due to my father's deep admiration for Ram's great uncle, K. Swaminathan, the editor of the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi, the hundred plus dull green olive uh, green uh, volumes of which occupied a prominent place in the massive bookshelves of our living room. The first time I recall meeting Ram was, it was at the NM, the Nehru Memorial Library, after a talk by him, where there was a private meeting that he had with B. R. Nandaji and my parents. And in that conversation, I recall between them there was warmth and respect and the familiarity of kindred minds and equals. My father was a great admirer of Ram's approach to history, of going beyond the Marxian methodology of ascribing events to economic and social forces alone, and in recognizing the extraordinary and significant roles played by individuals. And not merely the well-known big names, the Gandhis, the Tagores, the Nehru's, but others who contributed substantially and had interesting life stories, such as Beria Relvi, uh, and several other people who contributed to the literary and cultural richness of this nation. That is why they were such great admirers of R.K. Narayan, Shivram Karan, M.S. Subhulakshmi, <coughs> Malikarjan Mansur, Gangubai Hangal, D.G. Tendulkar, K.V. Suparna, and so on. And G.R. Vishwanath. And G.R. Vishwanath. Shaori's own approach was to write short, almost exquisite little sketches about such figures. Ram's approach is much more <coughs> systematic and scholarly, but just for them. This is not to say that they saw eye to eye on every matter. My father famously did not maintain a diary for future generations to understand the inner workings of Indian politics in the 60s and through the 80s um, at the highest levels. This is something that is invaluable to a historian such as Ram, and I think I've spoken a lot about it, how people don't write and maintain records. The other thing is something that my father did not voice directly to me, but hinted at a couple of times, that the environmentalists in Ram failed to acknowledge the sterling role played by Indira Gandhi in conservation and the environment, starting with what he considered one of the finest speeches he had worked on, a 1972 Stockholm Conference Address, a speech that has been twisted in so many ways by so many people. Perhaps good speeches are meant to be quoted, great ones misquoted. Ram, I'm sure Chowdhury would have eagerly read your book, Makers of Modern India, marking it with his editor's pencil, as well as Gandhi Before India, and also your upcoming book. I'm not sure how you and he managed uh, managed, managed to write so prodigiously, often over 5,000 words a day. But we hope to see many more books come from your pen, and to keep our Umberto Eco-esque anti 